Greetings from CNS and welcome to this new episode of NTB Dialogues, a special CNS series presenting insightful and thought-provoking interviews with leaders to accelerate progress towards ending tuberculosis. This series underpins the urgency to step up the fight against the epidemic. 193 countries have promised to eliminate TB by 2030. India has promised to end it by 2025. So we have only 135 months left to end the pandemic globally and just 75 months left to end it in India. However, the latest global TB report released just two days ago indicates that the world is not on track to meet the NTB strategy goals of 2020. The annual rate of decline of TB incidence still hovers around less than 2%. The cumulative reduction between 215 and 218 was only 6.3% against the target of 20% between 215 and 2020. There is still a large gap between the number of new cases reported, which was 7 million and the estimated 10 million. And India accounts for 25% of this gap. So we really do need new and fresh thinking to reimagine every critical cog in the wheel to end to TB, as well as accelerate progress towards SDGs. In today's special episode of NTB Dialogues, we are honored to have with us Dr. Rohit Sareen, Director of the National Institute of Tuberculosis and Respiratory Diseases India, which was formerly known as the LRS Institute, where I met him first. Dr. Sareen has over three decades of experience in the field of TB control. He has helped shape India's fight against the disease and was instrumental in framing and pilot testing of the revised National TB Control Program of India. Welcome, Dr. Sareen. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sareen, India has progressed a lot in controlling TB, but as we know, we are still far away from ending it and still have the highest TB burden of 27% globally. In today's context, how big is the threat posed by TB to health security? Well, I would say that TB is really continuing to be a major public health problem in India and even globally. I mean, it's really astonishing at times for us when we realize that, uh, you know, every day as we talk, nearly we have an added 10,000 patients and uh, the, the death would be uh, also uh, of a large number of patients. I mean, the estimates are that... Uh, every three minutes, two people are dying. So if you are going to talk for half an hour here, about 20 people in India would have died because of TB during this period. And I mean, this is happening from a disease which otherwise is curable, it, a disease which is preventable. And in the present day modern world, we are still continuing to struggle in this fight. I mean, that is something which is very surprising for us as professionals in the field and as part of the Indian society. So, so what's the way forward? Uh, and uh, before we go on to that, uh, just for the benefit of our listeners, uh, can you please explain the difference between active TB and latent TB infection? Because uh, I think that is important for all of us to know. Yeah, of course it is. You see, whenever a person inhales the TB germ, uh, there is a possibility of uh, about 30% that this particular individual will get infected. And in fact, the germ is not very strong because 70% of individuals who even inhale the germ, and if they are having a good immunity, they will not even get infected. Now, once this individual is infected, we say that there are two things which can happen. Either the body's own immune system will contain the organism there and it will not progress on to disease or sometime during the lifetime of that individual, there is a risk of developing disease and that is to the extent of only 10%. So even amongst those who are infected, 90% of individuals will not develop the disease. Individuals who are infected are called latent TB infection. That means 90% of these who are having latent TB infection will not move on to active disease. In India, if we made an assessment, so roughly 40% of our population 
40 percent that means over 400 million people in india are infected that means they will be having the organism within their body but contained there because of the body's own immune system and somewhere down the line 10 percent of them would develop disease in their lifetime depending upon various stress factors depending upon their immune status depending upon other comorbid diseases like diabetes which reduce immunity and so on uh, okay now uh, in india there were 2.69 million new cases of tb in 2018 and globally an estimated 10 million new cases of TB. Do all these cases or did all these cases come from this latent the TB pool of patients or people infected with latent TB? Yes, I mean, you see that always yes. happens because the first thing which happens with this particular infection is that you develop the infection within the body and that is what we call as a latent TB infection. And the breakdown occurs from those who are infected in this manner. Without infection, there is no disease. That is very clear. So every individual who develops disease passes through this phase of latency and then only develops into disease. There are a few numbers wherein we call as progressive primary disease, wherein the first infection itself at the time of infection moves on into active disease, the period of latency is very small. That is the incubation period is, is very small. And immediately after infection, the individual goes into a disease profile. Now, active disease. But that happens in a few. Largely speaking, a, a, a person goes into a period of latency which may last from days to weeks to even years and then develops the disease. Okay, so to prevent any new TB infections from occurring, we have to empty this latent TB pool. A am I right? Uh, we have to empty this pool of latent TB. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, would, I would put it like that, that yes. to uh, prevent more disease happening, more active disease happening, there have to be some interventions which mm -hmm will reduce the latent TB pool. That means we have to cut down transmission. And to cut down transmission in communities, the best way is, of course, to detect a TB patient early and to put the patient on effective treatment so that the patient is no longer infectious and is no longer transmitted. So that is probably the best way. Then, of course, there are other things which need to be addressed. Uh, we could have better housing, better ventilation, improve the economic condition of the patient. Uh, there are some administrative measures we talk of uh, educating the people that they should not spit here and there, cover the mouth when they cough, so that transmission as such gets reduced, right? Yes, yes. And no. of course, uh, I mean, you see, we also have to understand that of our 400 million people who are infected in India, only 10% have the likelihood of developing disease and that also anytime during life. So 90% of them will not develop disease. Yes. So when we think of, you see, targeting a group to prevent the disease amongst those who are latently infected, that means managing latent TB infection, in that situation, we have to really identify the group which has a greater chance of breaking down into disease. Mm -hmm. And then we give them some sort of a treatment, which we call as treatment for latent TB infection or preventive treatment. Mm -hmm. And there are some drugs which are there for this. And once we do that, the chance that this person who's having latent infection will develop into active disease considerably reduces. Okay, so what, what are the latest RNTCP guidelines for latent TB treatment? Uh, uh, treatment, uh, diagnosis also, testing and treatment. Because I may be carrying latent TB, doctor, for all that I know. I, I do not know why, why, if I belong to the high risk group. But uh, that 10% could be any one in the population. As you are saying that rightly, uh, we have to target the high risk population. Uh, but what, what, is the, what are the guidelines? Do we test every one of that 10% high-risk population and treat them for latent TB? You see, there are two strategies here. 
one is that what you are saying rightly that test and then treat yes but then there are certain situations in which even without a test we would treat okay and the government of india has taken this stand that if there is a child less than 5 years oh. in contact with a tb patient that particular child in any case will need to have chemo prophylaxis or treatment for ltbi provided we have excluded active tb in that child so here the effort is to exclude active tb and there is an algorithm diagnostic algorithm how to identify tb in children 5 years and below and once we exclude that then definitely we have to give the treatment which we have in the in the program we are giving a drug called isoniazid which is given as per body weight to that particular child for a period of 6 months every day then there is another group wherein we are advocating the ltbi even without testing for infection and that is the people who are living with hiv pl hivs in this group also because we are a high burden country their recommendation is that there is no need to test for infection however we have to exclude active tb here and there again there is an algorithm we follow for you know identifying tb amongst those who are hiv infected we call it the four symptom complex and if a person doesn't have these four symptoms the chance of that individual harboring tb disease is not there and hence we can give the patient a chemo prophylactic treatment or treatment for ltbi mm -hmm. however if a person is having disease then you have to treat the disease because if you if you uh, uh, you see give a disease person the single drug isoniazid then you are actually promoting drug resistance to isoniazid you are not doing the right thing so before we treat we have to rule out tb in these two groups then there are other groups in which we are saying that yes you need to first test either do a tuberculin test which is the montu test or the ppd test what we call it's a skin test or we do an igra which is a blood test and from there we identify that infection is there and then we start the patient in case the person is infected we start that person on the treatment and in this group i will include you see uh, inmates of jails congregate setting old age homes and healthcare providers also that's quite important you see people like us who are working in health facilities we have a greater probability of you see getting not only tb infection but also tb disease innumerable studies have shown that and hence this is also a very high risk group then there is a high high risk group who are you know taking Uh, say treatment for me uh, malignancy those who are taking drugs for malignancy those who are on you know chronic immunosuppressive therapy those who are on corticosteroid therapy for any disease like rheumatoid arthritis or any of the other connective tissue disorders people may be on long term steroids so in that context here also we have to adopt the policy of test and then treat okay Uh, now the treatment here the isoniazid preventive therapy is available uh, are there other treatment options there are other treatment options available is uh, rntcp considering using them also if uh, they are better than the current uh, regimen which we are having here and also are there side effects uh, i am just curious to know are there any side effects with this uh, treat, uh, the tpt as we call it treatment for uh, the tb prevention treatment and is there any chance of developing resistance to those medicines to those regimens yes i have already touched on the last point that mm -hmm. yes chance of resistance would be there if we are treating a tb patient suffering from active tb with just a chemo prophylactic treatment with a single drug mm -hmm. however if the person is not having active tb then the chance of resistance is not there so that is very clear cut second is that treatment options are available globally we are very well aware that there are different drugs also available different combinations also available 
different treatment durations are also available. Now, uh, India has adopted the strategy that we will give isoniazid for six months as a treatment whenever we are thinking of managing LTBI. However, we are also experimenting on the newer uh, recommendation, which is a 12-week treatment given as a single dose of two drugs, isoniazid and rifapentin, given once a week for 12 weeks. So it is just a 12-dose therapy. That's basically give it for about 12 weeks, and that takes care of the, uh, you know, the chance of developing or chance of breaking down from LTBI to active disease. So that is another therapy. Currently, there is also experimentation going on for a daily isoniazid and rifampentin, rifapentin given every day for one month only. So this is just a one month therapy, which is being uh, also, it's an acceptable option uh, uh, available uh, to the uh, professional community and to programs. Country looks into not only the efficacy part of it, not only the safety part of it, but also into operational feasibility. You see, when we are thinking of doing it as a programmatic aspect, you know, as a clinician, one can take his own view and give any of these therapies. But as a program, when we give a recommendation, it has to be applicable in large populations in the country where, where, wherein where there is so much to be done, we'll have to see feasibility. So keeping that in mind, the current recommendation is isoniazid. We are doing research on isoniazid rifapentin 12-week therapy that is already on and country is aware of treatment options for, uh, you see, shortening this further to one month and maybe somewhere down the line that would be the adoption for, for this management. Okay. Here again, I would like to say that we are talking primarily of the larger types of TB, which is drug-sensitive TB. But when we talk of drug resistant TB, there the, the recommendations of the country as on date is that we are not giving any prophylactic treatment, but we are following up the contacts very closely to see if there is any chance of breakdown and we are treating. Global recommendations are there with certain drugs like the quinolones, and of course, now uh, a newer recommendation with drugs like delaminate, but these are certain things which are in a research mode. So I would say that it is just for information of technical people that new work is going on in this direction, but the current recommendation continues to be that you do a regular follow-up of those contacts and see what happens to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, going back to latent TB, because um, I, I, I and I think many of our listeners would be curious to know more about it. Uh, have you come across any cases of treatment adherence problem for TPT or side effects with uh, treatment for latent TB? Have there been certain issues? Okay, uh, you see the greatest problem which we face with latent TB is to convince the parents, the patient, that a child who is not having any symptoms yes. needs to be given some drugs yes. and that also for a period of six months. Right. You know, that's, that's the biggest challenge for us. And needless to say that even though we convince, they may initiate the treatment, but somewhere down the line, they will drop out. In fact, dropout rates in different studies have varied anywhere from 25% to 50% even. So it is not only, you see, initiating the treatment, which happens in a small proportion, but even those who start treatment, a greater probability is that they may not continue on with that. However, protective efficacy is there and side effects are not a major issue with the dosages that are prescribed side effects are not a major issue that has already been tried and tested and that is the reason why these recommendations or these treatment options were given because when it started off it was you see isoniazid even given for longer times like i mean it has been found safe 
even if it is given for 36 months, like we give it in, you know, PLHIVs, people living with HIV, if we have to give treatment, we recommend for 36 months. Even at 36 months, it is safe. Hmm. One thing, of course, we have to keep in mind whenever we are giving these drugs, that the drug-drug interactions, in case the patient is having or the person is suffering from any other comorbid conditions, then the drugs which the person is taking for that comorbid condition, whether that interacts with the treatment that we are giving for LTBI. Now, that is something which uh, uh, is there. It, uh, the recommendations have all listed out the drugs wherein we have to be careful. And uh, uh, I think uh, there are clear-cut guidelines in that regard. Yeah, and I think it's not only in the case of children, doctor, but even in the case of adults, it will be difficult to ask an adult to take a medicine for something that I'm healthy. Why should I undergo that treatment or why should I take that medicine? I think that would be a big problem. Uh, you're right, you're right. Especially without getting tested. Again, this comes to my mind as a, a, on an individual basis. If I am told that where you are a high risk group, and you need a treatment for latent TB. I would say, well, how do? Uh, why should I take it? Unless if maybe if I'm asked to test, and if I test positive, then maybe that that will uh, uh, goad me on or urge me to take the treatment. So that issue could be there, and that is what I was about to ask you: that how to encourage the seemingly healthy people to opt for latent TB treatment or latent TB testing? That that could be an issue. I think uh, so. You know, uh, yes. what I will say to that is that uh, yes. even in policy, if you see mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. most of the individuals other than those who are living with HIV and other mm -hmm. than infants or children below five, mm -hmm. the policy is test and treat. Because mm -hmm. rightly so, you see the person who is to take treatment for six months has to be very clear about it that I do have that infection at all. If exactly. I don't have that infection, then what is the point of me getting treated? Right. right. But uh, what we have observed in clinical practice, that in the early phases, you see, when the patient comes, then the contacts of that patient are more motivated to start the LTBI. Somewhere down the line, as the patient symptoms are abating, and if you try to, you know, uh, trace out the contacts and try to convince them, then they feel that nahi, abhi to, uh, uh, hai, hame ab TB hone ka chance nahi hai. that is what is their usual response. And they, uh, the chance that they will accept LTBI treatment, even with testing, is, uh, is reduced. Right, yes. Uh, okay, now, uh, going on to, say, drug-resistant tuberculosis, you had mentioned it earlier. Uh, uh, what can you ex uh, tell us something about the uh, rollout of the new TB drugs, bedaculin and delaminid, and how do we ensure that no drug resistance develops to them? Because as TB advocates, we will we make a lot of UN cry. Everyone should get it. Maybe including myself, I have said, and it should be available to all. But uh, then, how do we balance the cautious this their cautious use with public health imper imperatives to make sure that no resistance develops to them. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, coming to the first part of your uh, uh, question, what I'll say is that uh, government has uh, defined the uh, guidelines for the use of both these drugs, mm -hmm. laminate and betacolin. Betacolin is now available in the entire country mm -hmm. under uh, a particular program, and uh, over 7,000 people have been put on bedocolin containing regimen in the country as on date. Every state in the country has this particular drug. So the earlier thing that no, okay, it's available only some places. We were having issues. People used to migrate from those places to our institutions, you know, just to get the treatment. But today that is uh, 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 not really required. And uh, uh, an individual can get the bedocolin based regimen wherever the individual is staying in the country. As far as delaminate is concerned, uh, we had, uh, uh, you know, some initial courses wherein we were uh, using this drug in a more restrictive manner, but uh, we have already ordered for more of this drug 
and uh, guidelines are available under which conditions to use. Especially this drug is very useful in children and uh, global guidelines also say that Delaminate would be a useful drug for children. Betacolin, only recently WHO has recommended it could be used in children up to the age of six, but earlier recommendation was only up to 18 years of age. So I, I would say that yes, the drugs are available. Country is getting experience with these drugs. We are understanding the side effects, the management strategies for these drugs, and we are very happy as professionals to admit that these drugs are very, very effective. Even in the most difficult of patients, we are getting a very high sputum conversion rate, a very early sputum conversion rate. I mean, in patients which we have put on treatment here in our institute, the NITRD, in the first week itself, nearly half the patients, 50% had converted. Just one week treatment with betacolin. So, I mean, these newer drugs, to us, this seems that they work like magic because these patients have gone into very different treatment options from one doctor to another, not getting any solace. And then when they receive this drug, they get better and better very fast. The question about making them available more widely, which is to be really seen with some caution because as we understand that we don't want to lose these drugs. We don't want that the bacteria should develop resistance to these drugs. So, therefore, very very so therefore, rational use of these drugs is very important. And as on day, rational use within the government system is possible. But rational use enforcement within the private sector is not possible. You see, because private doctors continue to practice management whatever they feel is appropriate. So that may involve a lot of training, a lot of education to the private sector that, well, yes, this is a good drug, but it has to be used under these specific conditions with this monitoring, with this look at the ECGs, this look at electrolytes. So all those aspects have to be brought on the forefront with the practitioners and then let the practitioners develop a linkage with the national program so that their patients could also get the benefit of this drug. You know, it has to be a partnership uh, between the public and the private sector. If we have to bring about more easy access of this drug, uh, you know, to patients, we all know that patients go to the private sector and they'll continue to go to the private sector. We understand that. So all the more reason that we need to develop you see this linkage in a more rapid manner and in a more stronger and sustainable manner. Okay. Uh, Doctor, from a stalwart like you, uh, we would really like to hear if you could suggest any new and out of the box approaches that would uh, really help us uh, realize this goal of ending TB and at least move faster towards it. Do we need to reimagine the whole of TB care and control or any out of the box approaches which you would like to suggest? Uh, what, what I'll say is that uh, we will have to look towards the issues as to why we are not achieving what we wanted to achieve. I mean, you've just told the figures, the rate of decline and all that being less than 2%, we wanted it to be 10%, 17%, like that. It's not happening. So why it is not happening? It is not happening because there are two things which are very clear. A large proportion of patients are actually getting treated outside the program. Program talks about patients, the data available to the patients of those who are coming to the program. Now program has, you know, with the efforts of the government taken a call that yes, notification is mandatory. So at least now people in the private sector some of them, I would say, are started to notify their patients on a more regular basis. And that is how, you know, we have enhanced our notification from the earlier 1.6, 1.7 million to what we have today of over 2 million patients that we are having. 
you know that is how it has happened but then it should be universal notification so all those who are existing should be actually detected and notified once they are notified one will be able to take care of them more effectively to ensure adherence to treatment because effective drugs are there it's not that they are not there only question is compliance the patient who is non compliant is actually a danger to society because he is not only you know having the disease within himself the disease may become drug resistant but he is also spreading that disease to all those with whom he is coming into contact so till we handle this particular problem the the thing will be a dream secondly you see research in other areas like vaccination is going on even at our institute the nitrd we are vac trying two vaccine candidates here at the institute as per a national protocol it's part of a multi centric trial that we are doing here and let us see the results if we hit on a good vaccine probably uh, our work will become a bit simpler but that does not in any way mean that the treatment adherence early diagnosis these will always be in a priority and i think program has to emphasize more on monitoring and supervision to ensure that whatever are the guidelines they are implemented in letter and spirit it's not just making a guideline is one thing but ensuring its implementation is entirely a different ball game very very true doctor thanks dr sareen friends we were listening to dr rohit sareen director of nitrd india in today's episode of ntb dialogues a special cns series presenting insightful and thought provoking interviews with leaders to accelerate progress towards ending tb we welcome to share your comments or reflections on this series at www.citizen-news.org thank you dr sareen and thank you for listening and staying tuned for the and to our listeners to and stay tuned for the next episode of ntb dialogues thank, thank you very much thank you thank madam you. and i will just end by saying that yes. together we can do it and together we will do it we yes. have to join hands that is the thing as a team we have to work and till we do that probably you know this dream will remain a dream yes thank you doctor thank you very much thank you